Ah, oh, hello, my dear viewers. Hello, young chap. And welcome to Green Cross English. Um, a cup of tea? Okay. I must admit, in many Americans, there is a little... Uh, a lit... Excuse me. A little... Oh, piece of... Uh, <laughs> Great Britain inside them. We used to be British, if you didn't know that. It was a British colony until 1775, when the Revolutionary War of Independence broke out. This was an extremely short version of American history, and you will hear more about it throughout this episode. For example, my visit in Boston. I will go on the so-called Freedom Trail tour. The tour shows important sites before, during, and after the Revolution. And today's literature is from Gwen Bristow's book, Deep Summer. It will lead us into the American Revolution, too. And our lovely Carolyn will make us wiser by talking about the passive and relative clauses. Samuel Adams and Thomas Jefferson were of great influence in the Declaration of Independence. And Boston was where it all began. Bostonian Paul Revere became a hero of the revolution. But my tour guide, Josh, an expert on Boston history, will tell you everything you need to know. Und halten Sie noch passive Formen Ausschau. Sie finden bestimmt welche. Are you Josh? Ah, yes, I am. How do you do? I'm pretty good, thanks. I'm, I'm your tour guide, and that's why I'm dressed this way. Well, I'm really excited about this Boston tour. So am I. What brings you to Boston? Well, my uncle Mike lives here, and I figured I'd come and visit him. Excellent. Well, shall we take a walk? Sure. Well, off we go. This is Boston Common. It was once used as a cemetery, and now it is a public park, mm -hmm. which is, in fact, the oldest public park in America. Boston is a city that is very old. Indeed. Samuel Adams, who was a patriot in the American Revolution, was buried here. What's the name of the cemetery? The Granary Burial Ground. Okay. And what's up with these bells? Oh, well, the church bells. In the 18th century, it meant fire, so everybody would come out to fight the fire. Okay. Now, of course, it just marks time. But as I like to say, the bell tolls for the British in Boston. <laughs> this is where the Boston Tea Party started. Many of our famous patriots met here at the Old South Meeting House to dump the tea into Boston Harbor. King says that the colonies ought to pay for the cost of the French and Indian War because he feels that the British Army is here in America to defend America against the Indians. Whereas Americans feel that's not really fair. We took up arms voluntarily to protect ourselves, our interests, and therefore maybe we could share it. So we come to our last stop, the Paul Revere House. This was built in the 1680s, which makes it one of the oldest standing buildings on the eastern seaboard. Wow. The house he lived in was very big. It was actually bigger than this. There used to be a third floor up on top, and somehow between then and now, this building was a bank and a tenement, wow. a hotel, a cigar factory, and yet here it is. You know, the book that I'm reading at the moment is very interesting. It says that Paul Revere, he never said the English are coming. That's true. He said the regulars are coming out. Hey, I'll tell you what. 
I really enjoyed the tour. I loved every bit of it. Thank you. How about if we go get a cold one? A Sam Adams? Why not? You buying? <laughs> Let's go. Hmm, a cold one. That sounds like a good idea. That's why I will be very passive and let my grammar patriot, Carolyn, take the active part. Charge! <lacht> Danke, Eric. Ja, wir sollten gleich loslegen, denn ganz einfach ist das Passiv im Englischen, wie auch im Deutschen, leider nicht. Aber das schaffen wir schon. Wie bilden wir im Englischen das Passiv? Mit der richtigen Form von to be und dem Past Participle. Ein Beispiel haben wir hier für Sie. Was, Vergangenheitsform von to be und build, Past Participle. Macht zusammen was, build, wurde gebaut, also Passiv. The house was built in the 1680s. The house was built in the 1680s. The hier übrigens, weil Josh über dieses eine ganz bestimmte, nämlich das Paul Revere Haus spricht. Sie erinnern sich bestimmt, mit the kann man auch hervorheben. Ich möchte Ihnen einen Satz zeigen, um die Funktionsweise des Passivs noch etwas klarer zu machen. Früher haben mal Kühe drauf geweidet, heute wird der Boston Common als öffentlicher Park benutzt. Das ist ein Passivsatz. Diesen Satz könnte man auch anders, nämlich aktiv formulieren. The public uses the Boston Common as a park. Hier stehen Aktiv- und Passivsatz untereinander. Sie merken schon, da wurde umgestellt. Das Subjekt, the public, die Öffentlichkeit, wird zum Objekt. Und dann mache ich hier auch noch mal ein zweites Strichlein. Das Prädikat bleibt, verändert sich aber eben von active uses zu passiv is used. Und das Objekt The Boston Common wird zum Subjekt. Sie haben jetzt etwas Zeit zum Verdauen und wir sehen uns später wieder, wenn es heißt Relativsätze. Alles ist relativ, Carolyn. After our little grammar excursion, We'll get back to the main topic of the episode, sightseeing, and of course, a bit of American history. In Boston, Massachusetts, you'll find the oldest commissioned ship of the U.S. Navy, the USS Constitution. It was built at the end of the 17th century. Today, it is a museum and a tourist attraction in Boston. The cowboy rescues a tourist's souvenir. So, the United States ship Constitution. Wow. Can you please take a picture of me in front of this outstanding ship? Sure. Which one? This one. Ah, all right. There okay. we go. And... Got it. Thank How's that? you. Oh, excuse me, but this picture is not sharp. Can you please take another one? How can a picture be sharp? I think it is time to call a cowboy. Hello, cowboy. I have a problem communicating. Can you please come to the rescue? Okay. I'm coming to the rescue. Seems to be the problem, ma'am. Nice hat, Cowboy. Thank you, ma'am. Ich hätte gerne, dass der Tourguide noch ein Bild von mir macht, weil dieses hier unscharf ist. Mm -hmm. Aber leider weiß er nicht, wovon ich rede. Mm -hmm. Kein Problem. Das deutsche Wort scharf hat viele Bedeutung, aber das auf Englisch hat nur eine. <lacht> Erstens, scharf wie scharfes Messer ist gleich sharp. Beispiel. Das Messer ist nicht scharf genug. The knife is not sharp enough. Zweitens. Scharf wie scharfes Essen ist gleich spicy. Das Essen war zu scharf. The food was too spicy. Und drittens. 
scharf wie unscharfes Foto. Ist gleich out of focus. Beispiel. Das Foto ist unscharf. The picture is out of focus. Thank you, Cowboy. Now I know the difference between scharf and sharp. You're welcome, ma'am. Remember one thing. If you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. The second thing you do is call a cowboy. If you visit Boston, uh, Klaus, I'm, I'm out of focus. Come on. Right there, mate. Perfect. So, here we go again. If you visit Boston, don't miss the trip to the former Navy Yard where you'll find the USS Constitution. Our Bostonian bar crew has a naval topic today, too. Of course, with another misunderstanding. Thank you, man. The docks in the harbor are full today. There's simply no space left. So why is your dock harbor running around? No. Docks in the harbor? Not Harper, her dog. Dog heist hund. G. G. Dog. Dock heist Hafenanlage. K. K. Dock. As you already know from Say It Again, Sam, British and Americans often use different words for the same things. And the language also varies in its spelling. From our last film, we have a good example. The word harbor. Here, it is spelled with O-U. In America, you would find it spelled without U. Americans like to shorten and simplify words. For example, what up, which means what's up, which also means how are you doing? More information about this comes from our language experts, Mr. Holmes and Mr. Bogart. <laughs> 